Do you hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Um, we have Spanish uh, <laughs> subtitles. Let me just change this. Um, oops, what happened to there? Put that there and change the settings. Subtitle setting to. I don't know why it was in Spanish. Oh, I know why it's in Spanish. There is. No, put it in English. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, welcome. My name is Kwok, and I'm at the European Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity. I also work at two other universities, and I have a docent title. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the ICF and adaptive physical activity, and um, the, the, the aims of this is to recap on the ICF. And so, by doing that, I will go through a little bit what has already been covered on what would be the rehab cycle. And then I have some examples of the ICF with adaptive physical activity, and in particular with sports classification and the link with that. So um, let me just move that there. Okay. I will try to end on time so we have uh, as much uh, of your break as possible. Right, so the ICF, um, just a quick reminder of what it is, it is to establish a common language to improve communication across the disciplines. So that will be in the physician's documentations, uh, OT documentations, nurses, diagnosis and interventions, social work interventions, physiotherapist diagnosis and interventions, occupational therapist diagnosis <laughs> and physicians diagnosis and interventions. It is not a professional specific documentation system. It is rather the starting point for common language for all health disciplines. So what do we mean by that? It was covered in the, in the previous lecture of the link between the medical professions to be able to work with the same patient and it being on a patient, um, on a patient level. So um, here we have a typical situation in an abstract way as presented by the WHO, but you might have these types of shapes and colors and sizes all together. And if you were a person trying to see patterns in this, what way would you do this? And this is the same thing that we have for humans, for different types of levels of functioning, different circumstances, and, um, and different uh, um, types of willingness to do things. So you might group them by their shapes as they are. So you would have triangles and circles and squares. And then you can see when you do this classification that you might bring commonalities together. And when we have this in terms of the ICF, this is what we do to generate the evidence. But what about if you then have to start looking at classifications based on hierarchies. So therefore you have something at the very top and things that are lower ordered. So what you see at the very lowest level, you have the red triangles and the gray triangles. So that's the lowest level of classification. But when you go up higher levels, you can see that there are, it belongs in a triangle group and not in the square group and not in the overlapping triangle group either. So, this is where you might have hierarchical classifications. And this is pretty much what the ICF is. It's a hierarchical classification rather than just having a whole set of parallel and horizontal level classifications. So we've seen this earlier and I'm just gonna pull out one thing from this about the diet and fitness. So in the ICF, when you look at the different types of codes in relation to physical activity, one common one is under this, um, under this self-care, because the person to do physical activity, they have to um, really initiate the physical activity themselves. They have to um, have their own motivation, their own volition, their own autonomy and choice to do physical activity. And interestingly, when the ICF was created, uh, when it was created, 
in 2001, as a result of major work from the previous classification, um, they combined this um, classification of managing diet and fitness together. So when you have these communications with your colleagues and you're maybe working with other therapists that are concerned with the day-to-day -day activity of a person, they may be looking at this code but then when you're speaking to someone who looks at the dietitian, they would also be looking at this code. And potentially there could be a bit of uh, conflict between the professionals in terms of the stat status of that individual in their ability to look after one's health. So this is just the, the, the only one, this is the one code that I find quite, um, quite frustrating, should I say. Frustrating is maybe the right word in the sense of when working with, with others, particularly when we're looking at prevention of obesity. Because in, in the physical activity world, physical activity is independent from, from, uh, from food and energy intake. However, it has the same out, it has, it influences the same outcome in the sense that it may produce more obesity. So we agree upon that, but we, what we don't necessarily agree upon is the, ability, the person's ability for functioning in this particular domain. And this is probably the only area in the ICF that still needs much more work on that. So between 2016 and 2019, um, there was a group of people from Finland and from Sweden that, that came together and tried to provide the evidence to separate these two functions into a separate code. So therefore you would have um, more parsimonious agreement with regards to uh, the person's uh, ability to look after one's health. That even if they have difficulties in managing their diet, but they had, had, were able to maintain their own uh, fitness, that, that you could have two separate ways of coding things. Uh, and likewise, the other way around, if a person is able to manage their diet, but actually doesn't have any abilities to maintain their physical fitness, then afterwards you can code them differently and still respect and, and identify the interventions that are then needed to improve that person's ability to look after their own health. As a result of this work in, in uh, up until 2019, um, the WHO came back to us and said, it's still not enough evidence to say about this type of um, uh, uh, function is still codependent on each other. And we were very surprised by this, but what it also means is that our level of evidence to provide this independent um, uh, function is still much warranted, it's still much needed. We still need to provide the evidence that they are independent and it also affect the person's life. Now, I think we have lots of evidence for this because we've seen from the WHO, the, 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 some of the, the best uh, NCD um, prevention mechanisms. And one of them is, is uh, reduce reduction of, of salt. And the other one is to improve on physical activity, i.e walking and they're independent and you get the best uh, best you get your money back from the health policy system here so when we work in on the ground and we're trying to encourage more behavior change and we need support from the policy okay. level which is one thing that is is created at the icf um, and we need to also promote much more physical activity as well and prevent physical inactivity now, uh, on this browser, if I was just to put physical activity, what we can see, if I just pull it up here, is we can see physical activity appearing multiple times in terms of ways, particularly in interventions. So for example, if I was to um, uh, click on in physical activity behaviors, I'm gonna be going all the way down to this level here, which is under, the ICHI, and as you should have just been, should be aware of, as mentioned just before, there is the International Classification of Health Interventions. And under this, then there is physical activity behaviors, which is belongs to the lifestyle related behaviors. So the WHO recognize 
that intervention wise, physical activity can stand on its own. And as you can see just above it, there's eating behaviors. But what it doesn't match with at the moment, and we still have work to do for this, is to demonstrate that the actual classification on the ICF is not separated. And what we can see with physical activity interventions is that there's quite a lot of different types of interventions that you can include in here. So for example, you might want to educate them with their guidelines, okay? So that's to educate, to influence their own behaviors. You might have training to influence their behaviors. Uh, you might have the education of the importance behind it. You could advise physical activity behaviors, counsel physical activity behaviors, have advocacy in relation to physical activity behaviors. So in that sense, that then you would be able to provide at the policy level that physical activity is important for them. To educate that there's a variety of physical activity behaviors is also just as important as a health intervention, as well as offering peer support. So that means you would not just do physical activity on your own, in your own place, like in your own apartment, but potentially you could be doing it with other people, going outside to a gymnasium or if, if there is no COVID restrictions, or if you're doing it remotely, as um, uh, you can do things that are potentially um, uh, grouped online group exercises. There's also the need for potentially for environmental modification to influence physical activity behaviors. So again, this is a situation where in, in, without the COVID restrictions, you may have more physical active spaces you might have wider pathways or bike lanes or more access to green spaces or even um, uh, uh, ways to encourage people to move more. So that may mean having parking spaces slightly different away from the actual main entrance door. Um, and likewise, in the same way of accessing buildings that may have the facilities to do so, you might need some physical um, modifications to it. There might be, have to be ramps if the person is in a wheelchair, for example, or that um, the, the level of incline on each step is not high, too high that it creates too much exertion for the person so they can safely walk up the stairs using handrails, et cetera, et cetera. And also then, uh, depending on the target group, whether it's for the older adults or whether it's for adults or children, adolescents or young children, that there, there needs to be safety precautions around for doing physical activity. Other interventions that have been recognized uh, is the capacity building. So we need more people that are, have the ability and knowledge to work and build on physical activity uh, promotion strategies. So in health promotion, purposes, you have to create programs to allow the community to be physically active. They need to be linked in with uh, the, the, the physiotherapists and other therapists involved that may take people out from acute rehabilitation to the community setting. And likewise, then there may be something that goes beyond this, which could go into sport levels. And again, you need the right level of coaches, you need the right level of equipment, and people aware of physical activity that can be improved. And again, that's also the next one of raising awareness of this. And also policy change as well. So for example, at the workplace, whether people should have activity breaks at all or not, or, or given the, at least the opportunity to do so and not be sanctioned at work. At governmental levels to try to encourage having more ways to have physical activity behaviors um, and, and for them to change it and invest into physical activity as a main way of preventing uh, further, um, further problems down the line. And those problems could be non-communicable diseases. It could also be prevent, um, problems with regard to social integration, with regards to stigma amongst people who, who, who do not like or do not appreciate or understand what different groups of people there are and are of them. So, um, so I think this is something um, that uh, one needs to bear in mind of when we look at the ICF and how it's now worked with the interventions. This is still work in progress, as you can see. Um, like if I was to click on public health surveillance, okay, we have some information here and on, this would be the definition of the intervention 
of physical activity behaviors. But let's say I was to look at um, a different kind of interve um, intervention. There may not be any information about this. So here we see set an exercise duration. There is no real description of the intervention per se. And that solely depends on understanding what does it mean by the duration of the exercise? So do we talk about it's, it's the whole overall duration of the exercise? Is it a one hour session? Or are we talking about the bouts of the exercise? So they should be doing a continuous amount of activity for a minimum of 10 minutes to, for a certain type of condition. Or should it be five minutes or 15 minutes, depending on the condition? And this requires knowledge and expertise in understanding physical activity to be able to do it in a safe way and also in a, uh, in a, in a helpful way that would then go forwards with regards to the person's um, with the person's own level as they move in the ICF um, 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 uh, kind of uh, rubric, which I will demonstrate in a little bit. But I thought it was really in interesting and to point out that this intervention work, it has to be evidence-based. And if, if there's anything to take away from this is the work that you do in physical therapy, in physiotherapy, that they try to make it evidence-based and try to make it um, available so that people who, who formulate these databases with the family of um, um, international classifications can then take this information to then inform better with regards to this classification system. So uh, that means you, you try to make sure you have well-described studies, well, well-planned studies, described studies and reporting and availability of that information. So moving forwards from this uh, example of how to use this WHOFIC. So WHOFIC is the WHO family of international classifications and on their website of how to look at the different types of interventions, how does it get linked with the ICD, how does the ICD, ICF and ICHI all work together uh, to, to then um, uh, inform how we sh should really be doing things or at least looking for ideas of how to do things. So as I mentioned, the family of classifications <clears throat> under the WHO comprises of, of the ICF, the ICD is now ICD-11, and the ICIH, ICHI. Okay, so uh, it should be IH. Okay, so, and what has been presented here is a novel way for you to have a look at this, which is the family of international class classification versus SOAP. And what SOAP has been produced as is the subjective problem and the objective examination lab, which you center yourself at the ICF, but be aware of how it's connected with the ICD and the international health uh, interventions. Okay, so that therefore that's the uh, assessment and diagnosis, as well as the plan of the health intervention. Um, another way to look at the ICF is the understanding of the disability and the functioning. So there's been discussions in the past whereby uh, the, the international classification of function, the F of the international classification of function is regarded as a positivistic statement. But the next word to international classification of functioning is disability before health. So it's actually ICFDH, but of course it sounds much nicer for ICF and easier to say. But don't, don't I would say, try not to forget this because in one way, if, if you have a, something that you act positively, like doing physical activity, there could be a negative to it as well. And if, for example, if you don't do the physical activity that is helping the functioning, it creates the person to have more limitations or restrictions or impairments, and they have more disability. And likewise, if a person defines themselves to have lots of disabilities, 
with their impairments and they're unable to, to work and improve on their body functions and structures, then they remain to, be, to have disability. But it's also possible under this continuum to improve the person's impair, um, kind of not improve, but potentially look at the way that their impairment have in relation to their movement. So whereby it can then be shifted to say that they are functioning and it's, and it's considered as a, in a positive way. And in the same way for the activities that are provided for them, if they feel that they have a limitation to take part in something like um, playing golf, for example, or, um, or, or even going into an exercise room, that, that limitation in itself, if the equipment is not possible for them to do that, without making that change, without making that um, actual strengthening of muscles improvements, then they are unable to, to do the activity. And likewise with the restrictions, if you prevent them from, from being able to, to do these activities, then they have no participation in society as well. So this is a, an, another way, a novel way to look at the ICF. And I will show some other figures of this later on as well. So briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rehab cycle. And this comes from the Swiss unit at the ICF branch. And what it basically is, is the, the, to start off with the assessment, the assignment, the intervention and the evaluation. And that works with the ICF within mind of how it works and ties with the ICD and the ICHI. So the first stage is to do the assessment. And you look at, you look at the assessment through the overview of the function state. Next is the class categorical profile. And you, you look at that categorical profile in the current state as in that person for today which you can then compare and work with your colleagues for that. In addition to that, there's the idea of creating goals and when those goals are going to be set. There's then the intervention table to draw out the interventions that should be used to help with that categorical profile before then there is the evaluation display. So people can visually see across uh, different sectors and partners to see what is the assessment of that person. And then we go back to the assessment again. So in, in short, so I hope you can see this, the ICF assessment sheet gets the patient's perspective as well as the health professional perspective in regards to the issues of, of that person. So here's just an example, and this is taken from the Swiss branch, of the ICF, that for example, the person's perspective is that from time to time, they have pain in the back and their bladder and bowel is impaired. So the exercises, but the exercises do not exhaust them. And likewise, the, the health professional may, may make an assessment. And if we look at the activity side and we look at some of the codes, we might say, well, the person has complete limitation in overcoming barriers with the wheelchair. So we see that this person uses a wheelchair um, and they have limitations in dressing and limitations in changing body positions. So what this could mean in particular with the next one with instability in sitting position, it could mean that you're limited with regards to what interventions you should, um, you should include or what you might have when you discuss with your colleagues. There's also the environmental factors which are coded and then there's the personal factors which are not coded, but these are typical individual characteristics which are independent from what's been coded. So you may have to use some patient reports. So there could be some questionnaires that could be asked by the person rather than asking them for every single item under the, in each of the chapters of the ICF. Potentially there are ready-made questionnaires uh, that can be used to assess uh, their level of, um, of, of functioning. Then there is the categorical profiling. So what you see here is, is that you see the key functions identified from both the, the health professional and the, the personal um, perspective. And you see the levels of qualifiers from there. And the qualifiers, it's very standard in this way. And usually people who, who work with this should be coded and trained with this to understand what is 
considered a difference between zero and one and two, three and four. So hopefully you are already aware of this. But for this particular person, you can see that, that um, in their first cycle of goal, their first thing is mobility. The next cycle goal is self-care and the third one is to do sports. Okay, so their global goal is complete independence and try to get to university because this person was a 19 year old male. And what to do for this is that at the service level is to create, make them to be independent in activities of daily living. And so you can see, for example, um, on the goal relation is in relation to which cycle they are working at. So you can see the one in the pain in the back, that's to do with mobility. So that's a goal that needs to be reduced with regard to the qualifier. And then afterwards, if you look at the goal value, that would then be when you, re when you revisit it the next time round of whether that's been uh, completed at all or not through the intervention. So this is the, at the first stage of what the person may have on their profile. The next stage is then to look at the intervention table. So by looking and understanding which interventions there are available that are evidence-based and would work, uh, in relation to those functions, you, the, there is a process of mapping the intervention and the function and the, the team that are involved in this. So again, we see the top one, which is the pain in the back. And so the intervention would be a control in sitting position as well as taking medication. And who are the people that are gonna be involved in this controlling of the sitting position? Well, according to this chart, there would be the nurse, There'll be the physical therapist or the sports therapist, as well as the occupational therapist. So they will be all involved in, in, in improving the control of sitting position of this individual. And the medication, in this regard, it will be the physician, as well as the nurse, who will be in control of what medication to take in relation to the pain, and to assess this in terms of, of the dose. So with these five, four, four individuals, they're all working together to improve the way that a person, um, th this male in particular, would then have a function in, re in relation to the pain in the back. And you would, this mapping would go for each of those, uh, those functions that are listed here. And as you can, this is just a snippet of, of what there is. And there's also other people that could be involved, but is not listed here. And that includes the uh, psychologist, they could be the social worker, they could be the architect. For example, if they are in, involved in, in building designs for getting access to places. This is used to assess before and set the expectations afterwards for, for goal setting and, uh, and, and to, tr to keep track of who needs to do what and for whom it is for. So once that is done, then you get to the evaluation display and this becomes the, the display where the individual can see it and the different health professionals can also see it as well. Uh, and in this situation, you can see on the right hand side, you can talk about when you can see the evaluation that took place 16 weeks post trauma of when his accident happened. And you can see that the pain in the back would have gone down from three and a bit to two. And so has a goal been achieved? And that's a, that's been a negative in that regards. This has mainly been used for sharing with the rehabilitation team and for future planning. So we can move forward and see that the person is able to move forward from their goals. And in this particular case, this person has decided to choose sport as their main goal. So just to give an example of, of this, um, in another setting, there, there are the core sets. Now this was also mentioned slightly early on, but I wanted to just show you how the core sets work. And um, I'm gonna show you through screenshots, but of course it would have worked better if I showed it to you live. So in this situation, I'm gonna take an example of the vocational rehab brief set. So when you choose the core sets, if you go to the website icf-core-sets.org, you'll get the opportunity to create your own core sets. And I'm just choosing this vocational rehabilitation brief as an example. 
you click on that area, you click next, and then afterwards you get to see the, um, see the documentation form in step two. And it will show you all of the ICF items that belong to that course set in relation to this vocational rehabilitation brief. And you can select the ones that you feel are important, or you can leave them all open, which means that you're gonna use all of the ones that belong to that core set. Once you have done that, then afterwards uh, you, you go to the overview just to confirm that these are the areas that you want the documents to be built on. And when you've done that, you then get into a live web page, which will show something as demonstrated on the right hand side, where you can measure and detect, um, oh, sorry, not measure, uh, but input information about that individual to get a report form. Now, what you can see on this is that the, the classification is from zero to four and then eight and nine. So hopefully you're aware of how to classify between zero and four, but also the classification for eight when it's not specified and nine when it's not applicable, as well as then areas to put information in. For example, if there's case history where you've got the information of this individual. So for example, on this energy drive and functions um, uh, function, if, if you had a documentation that's talked about the energy drive, you can check that box for case history. If you needed to use a survey, you would use patient reported questionnaire. Um, if you had a clinical examination for some kind of functioning, uh, you would check that. And if there's a technical investigation, as in, as in you had some other corroborating evidence to support this, you'd also check that as well. You'd also have space to describe the problem uh, with some text and some information to help to support the document that gets provided. So for example, if I was to use this assessment and, um, and we wanted to uh, check out these particular codes, the E330, D850, D855, B130 and B455, because these are related some to physical activity, uh, one needs to uh, be aware of how to get this type of information. So there are a couple of, in, couple of instruments we might have used for patient reported questionnaires. So in relation to, um, to the first one, which is people in positions of authority, it's this item on the left-hand side, which is the physical activity re readiness questionnaire. And there are seven items which are asked whether there's a doctor that has um, stated that they have a heart condition, so to not do physical activity whether there's pain in the chest on a day-to-day -day basis, whether there's dizziness, whether there's any bone or joint problem that gets worsened due to physical activity, whether the doctor prescribes drugs or whether there's any other reason. And this is the doctor that does this, this assessment and there's a simple yes or no to ask if the person is ready to take part in physical activity. And then if, 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 there are, if, there is, if there's an indicator of a yes, then that has been told the individual has been told potentially by the doctor that they cannot do any exercise. However, if there's no contraindication, then what is a good idea is to get a fitness appraisal along with this, uh, um, along with this evidence, just to then find out where they are with regards to physical activity and their level of fitness. On the right-hand side is the person's uh, habitual physical activity scale. And there are three dimensions in this, in this scale. There's the work environment, the sports and leisure. So I'm only gonna to demonstrate to you the sport dimension where there are some items in relation to the self-perception of the person's level of physical activity compared with others. And this would be a comparison with others that the person can identify with, and they would perceive themselves if they are less the same or more physically active than the comparisons. This in combination with these other items, such as the frequency of, of them sweating. So how often do they sweat? The frequency of doing sport in their leisure time. The intensity of the sport that they do. Is the sport, for example, playing golf or is the sport playing squash? These are two activities that have very different levels of intensities in playing. How many hours per week is the person doing the, doing the sports? And how many months in the year are they doing it? 
So for example, if it's a seasoned sport, for example, tennis, are they only playing it in the summer or are they playing it throughout the entire year? So when you combine all of these together, you get a sport dimension score, and that could then provide the evidence from the patient report. So here's the example here of the energy drive that potentially an individual has the low sport score because let's say they were not doing much sport at all. There was also a functional examination um, of their energy drive and um, if that was at all possible and a case history of low levels of physical activity. And once you have done this on the web form on the core sets website, you would then get a functioning profile, a simplified version of what you saw earlier under the rehab cycle. Now this is a starting point of what, what you can then see that you can then share and say, this is the assessment you've done on the individual for the time being, and you're now gonna pass it to your colleague who's then going to also be aware of this as well. In addition to giving it to the patient themselves. Now, of course, this can also be exported and this kind of information will be exported uh, in, in multiple ways, potentially as an Excel sheet, which can then go into a health information system. And uh, of course, that's potentially for another, another lecture altogether. But you can see that this contains all of the information re in relation to the ICF. So there's the body function, so that's the BF qualifier, the BS, um, which is body structures, the AP activity participations and the EF environmental factors. And then the indications of the sources of information. Where does it come from of those four sources? As well as finally, what is a bit more description so you qualitatively get an idea of, uh, of, of what the person is, is experiencing. So now that we have some of those examples and a reminder of the ICF, I will just go through quickly the applications with the um, adaptive physical activity. So hopefully you are all aware of the IPC, it's the International Paralympic Committee. And what you'll see at the very top is, is this diagram going from white to black. And I like to use this in terms of understanding how we use the ICF in terms of understanding functioning that we are aware of two certainties in life. One of them is that we are born and the other one is that we die. But everything in between that is unknown and uncertain. And this is where we have our health and we have our functioning. And that's where we start to have the shades of gray and the, the darker grays as we get towards the, the last few days. Now, put that in mind when you look at Paralympic sports, Okay, they also need to have a level of classification as well. So I have two examples here. We have a swimming and we have sailing sports. And what they use is that they use the ICF in, in three different phases. And I'll expand on this in a little bit more later on. But the first phase is to see whether there's a body functions which would then lead to impairments. So it can be classifiable as, as, as to have in, impairments to the level of conducting sports. The second phase is then to see their impairment, to see how it is in a sport environment. And so, for example, in swimming, if um, you, you, the assessment would be to see how well they float or dive, how well they turn, how, how well they stroke, how, what kind of strokes they do and what kind of kicking they have to determine their level of classification. And in swimming, there are then 10 classes. And there's 10 classes in swimming because of course, certain limitations are more severe than other limitations. So we cannot just have a one single class of disability in a swimming pool, because then it would potentially mean that people with greater severity would not be able to compete against those with less severity of, of impairment. So there are 10 different classes that differentiate and group some people together in a fair and even playing field as much as possible while still excelling on, on sports competitions. So it provides a structure for competition and the athletes in para sports have an impairment that leads to a competitive disadvantage, which is why we need to have this classification. It is a system that puts in place to minimize the impact of impairment on sport performance 
and to ensure the success of the athlete is determined by the skill, fitness, power, endurance, tactical ability and mental focus. There are currently 10 eligible classifications. These include the impaired muscle power, which could be the reduced force, the impaired passive range of movement, which will be a permanent uh, range of movement that's, that's been impaired, a limb deficiency, this could be at birth or it could be through trauma, such as amputation. There could be a leg length difference, as in there could be bone shortening. There could be short stature of an individual. Hypotonia, which is like the increase in muscle tension. Ataxia, which is the, the lack of muscle coordination. Atheosis, which is unbalanced movements. Visual impairment, which would include the eye structure and visual cortex, as well as intellectual impairment as they've been classified before the age of 18. So the sports, so the sports based, um, the sports based, sorry, let me just mute this person. The sports based classification has different impairments on similar events on sports. Uh, and due to the low number of athletes, the combined events leads to coefficients and corrected scores in certain classes and certain sports. Whereas, for example, in power sports, they just either have a disability or not. And whereas in team sports, they may be based on a points-based system. So the process is a little bit more complicated than just a three-step process. It's actually three and a half per se, okay? And we'll go through this in a little bit. But the classifiers need to have a medical background or technical background, okay? And also psychologists are used for intellectual classification. When we mean a medical background, this could also mean having a class qualification as a physiotherapist, as a physical therapist as well. So therefore, if you're interested in working in elite disabled disability, or shall I say power sports, okay, this could be one route to get involved in, in um, in, in power sports is to become a classifier. And to be able to be aware of this, you've got to have very good skills and uh, uh, clinical reasoning, as well as being able to know which types of tests to use for what types of functions. Now it's a little bit easier than, potentially easier, because in a sports setting, um, under certain sports, you, you might know of what kinds of impairments and what kinds of movements to be assessing for. Whereas in a day-to-day -day basis, you have so many different types of people with over 10,000 ICD codes and, and several hundreds and, um, and thousands of ICF codes, then that might be more complicated to, to do, to look at. But there are four stages that should be used for classification or athlete evaluation. The first stage is that whether there's a health condition that could lead to an eligible uh, impairment. The second one is the interview and physical assessment. This is where you use the skills as the physical therapist to understand uh, the individual and to see um, whether they have their impairment is of the class level that it should be. So typically you would evaluate the impairments. So you might do some range of movement, strength, strength tests, some measurements tests. You also look and take into the athletic history. So you might have to interview them as well as then be aware of some novel and sport specific motor tasks. So they could be, for example, uh, only used in a wheelchair setting of, of inducing power. Okay, um, you then, after the physical assessment, need to be aware of the sport specific assessment. So look at things in relation to the sport themselves. And once you've done all of this, then after you've got to see them in observation during competitions. And this is important because some people during the actual tests, they may, um, they may uh, not perform as well as they should. So they get a higher level of classification. So they feel like they may have a better chance of winning. And, and this, is, uh, this is illegal under the IPC, but it also means that the person who is doing those assessments, they have to have good enough communication skills they have to have good enough skills of knowing the range of movements and different tests and the expectations needed for a person with um, 
with impairment to be of a certain level of classification. And the way the, the classifier learns about this is through the in-competition observation as well. If they are, let's say, we're looking at reduced muscular, uh, muscle strength, and they, the, we, one of the tests is to ask them to push against the hand. And you, you have an assessment of to feel how much force they have against your hand as they're pushing. If you, if you feel like they have no force, so this would be the, the classifier's hand, this is the athlete's hand, and you're pushing and they, they have no, they, you ask them to push against your hand and you're putting some resistance there, but they're unable to, to, to do anything on this, but you see them on the court and then they, they, they push someone else on the court, then you, you know that they have misrepresented themselves. And this misrepresentation at classification is illegal. So through this process of learning this from the in-competition observation, it might mean that you have to do a different kind of test just to double check that the force from that individual is actually true to what it is rather than a misrepresentational test. So there's, these are the different types of classifications. There's the sport classes, there's the descriptions um, uh, for the different sports in archery, athletics, boccia, power canoe, cycling, equestrian, football, goalball, judo, powerlifting, rowing, shooting, sitting, volleyball, and swimming, table tennis, power triathlon, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair fencing, wheelchair rugby, and wheelchair tennis. And now the, the idea behind evidence is becoming a stronger and stronger um, notion under the IPC. So what has been asked for from the different sports federations is to provide evidence-based classification. And again, I go back to what I mentioned earlier on that the evidence that is needed to inform the ICF is also the evidence is needed for evidence-based classification as well for the IPC and in Paralympics and for power sports, in a, even if it's not a Paralympic sport. So in definition, an evidence-based system of classification is one in which scientific evidence indicates that the methods used for assigning class will achieve the stated purpose. Okay, so therefore you have to demonstrate some proof that um, a certain range of movement would lead to a certain classification level because it impairs their sport performance in one way or another. And therefore they should not be competing against other people who have a different range of movement because they have exceedingly unfair advantage over the other person. And there is a four step model that's been proposed by Tweedy. So the first step is uh, specify the eligibility. So look at the sport itself and try to see what is eligible to make that person to, uh, to have uh, an impairment in sport. So therefore, what is the level for them to be sufficiently impaired to be able to compete in power sports? You then need to develop valid measures of impairment. So now you've set your eligibility criteria on impairment, what can you do to measure to make sure that that level of impairment is the right level of impairment compared with another type of impairment? And along with that, there should also be sport specific measures of performance. There's a current debate about whether sport should lead to classification or classification should lead to sport. So that's why you, it's important to also have not only measures of impairment, but also sport specific measures of performance as well. And then the last step is to assess the relative strength of association between these two uh, uh, measures. And you put that in practice and you create evidence from this. So here's an example of this four step model of what's currently happening in swimming. So there was a total of, from a literature review, there's 51 studies that, uh, that, they that um, Oi, Lee and Payton found in terms of the evidence-based um, classification for swimming. And what they found was that there was, um, a majority of the studies were developing sport-specific measures of performance 
but none of them had gotten down to the step three yet, which was to assess the relevant strength and association between the valid measures of impairment and the sport specific measures of, of, of performance. What you'll see is that with the sport specific measures of performance, you see that most of them were on freestyle. So that's the front crawl. And also majority of them were looking at limb deficiency and motor coordination impairment, as well as impaired muscle power. So what it means is that this, to get swimming classification through these four steps to say that, yes, they have evidence-based classification. They have still much more work to do yet on this because they have not specified the eligibility yet. They have used a classification system that was derived before this evidence base, and they have not necessarily um, demonstrated that there's agreement on this. And this agreement would usually involve what we call um, a Delphi study of experts, athletes, coaches, classifiers, um, and, and, and biomechanics, um, many other different types of professions to understand what it is that is the right levels of eligibility for the different classifications. In more details, you can see that uh, they broke, uh, the, the presenters of this presentation, they, they broke down the different types of, of, um, of, of, uh, of, of um, the, the sports models. And what you can see is the time to swim is the one that's used the most and that's spreads out down to the furthest with regards to the amount of force they produce and therefore leading to their information about classification. A few more different presentations on the ICF very, very quickly. So this is something that we have, have looked at for, um, for a child-based ICF. We wanna make sure that fitness is included in a day-to-day -day basis, that we have to look at their function, have to increase their awareness of having friends involved with their family, make sure that everything is fun and look towards the future. This is a nice simple way to just look at the ICF without having to think about codes and think about um, uh, uh, levels of, of um, you know, the contextual factors, personal factors and body functions, et cetera, et cetera. Another way that I presented in previous lecture was that the way that we should start looking at when we look at interventions is to put the ICF upside down. So we look at the modifiable areas first. So that would be the personal factors and the environmental factors. And from um, a, a recent, well, a, a literature review that looked at this, with it being upside down is actually the health condition is in the same realm as the personal factors, because these are the areas that can be modified, not the health condition, but it belongs to the individual. But the parts that can be modified are the self-efficacy of the person, the intention of the person, the attitude to physical activity of the person as well, as well as the social influences. So that's the family, friends, colleagues, health professionals, general opinion, as well as the other barriers and facilitators at the environment, such as transportation, um, the facilities, assistance of others, equipment, and so on and so forth. So these have provided us good evidence to say that physical activity and people with disabilities uh, fit within the ICF framework. Um, I'm going to end it on just this level here, but I need to uh, just stop sharing and restart again. Okay, so I'm going to just show you the beginning of this. Hello, it's Peter Downs here, and welcome to part one on adaptation theory to practice. Now, one of the things we really like to take a crack at here at the Inclusion Club is translating theory into practice. Now, generally speaking, you can separate research based theory and practice into two camps there is research and there is practice. Unfortunately, it's often the case that the two things are quite different and separate from each other. They are isolated, which is not the way it should be really. Research and theory should inform practice. So we like to try and bridge the gap between 
theory and practice here at the Inclusion Club. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you today, uh, a great pleasure to introduce you to the work of a man who really does understand this and most importantly, connects research and practice in a very positive way. Okay, so um, I think we're out of time. So I would encourage you to have a look at this video. Um, it's called the Adaptation SEMA model. And, um, he and, and then uh, it's a very interesting model with regards to physical activity. Uh, outside of the sport domain, but promoting physical activity. It uses the different concepts of adaptation theory, the ICF and action systems theory. And there are five different steps towards this. And potentially this is one thing that you could try to put in practice and it's very applicable in this way. So in conclusion, the ICF creates a system to connect individuals, professionals and outcomes of, uh, of, of persons for persons. The ICF and sports classifications require evidence-based approaches and is still in its early days. An ICF and adaptive physical activity is needed to promote physically active lifestyles. So I will stop sharing. I welcome comments and questions. Um, 